a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the tenth part of the reading against the Roman Papacy, an institution of the devil. The book Martin Luther wrote in 1545 and published in 1545, before his death in 14, uh, 1546. This is to be considered as his last work, and um, a very important one. One could say that his main important work in his life was, of course, the Bible translation into the common German language. And I would put this book right on place too, behind the Bible translation. Because this is a biblical, historical and prophetic explanation of why the Roman Catholic Church, the hierarchy of it, the papacy, the top of the Roman Catholic Church, is the biblical historical and prophetic antichrist. Martin Luther uses this book to defeat the stance that the Pope has never legitimately gotten his title, his position that he claims, nor by scripture, nor by temporal powers that had the power to give it to them. We are speaking about the period of 606 and Emperor Phocas, who gave the spiritual power to the then bishop in Rome over the Eastern Churches in Constantinople and over the Western Churches in Rome. <coughs> By that, that emperor made him the head of all the churches. But that's not a power the, the emperor even has to give to the bishop. Because you can only give power that you have for yourself, and then you can delegate it, but you cannot invent this power. If anyone has this power to give that to anyone, it is our Father who actually gave that to his Son, to Jesus Christ. He made him the head of the church. God has the power to do this because God has the power to do everything. <laughs> You know, he is infallible, omnipotent, and nothing was made that was not made by him. So he can give power to anybody that he wants. But the emperor cannot do that. No, he's just a normal man, just like you and me. And the bishop of Rome cannot do that because he is just a normal man like you and me. So what are we talking about here? We are talking about assumed power. The dragon gave him the power, as we read in Revelation 13. Okay? But what can the dragon give? Only what is given to him, right? So when the dragon, the serpent, the devil, is the god of this world, he can delegate that power. But... As far as I understand it, the devil, the dragon, Satan, can only give power in his realm. He does not have any power over God's realm, right? Anyway, this is a discussion maybe for some other point, and I don't want to go too deep into that, but we have to understand that the Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible, assumes power and then he refers to, I got it from this source, temporal, emperor focus, on the one hand, and I got it from this source, in the Bible it is said, on the other hand. But his explanations of the Bible are untrue, because Peter never was in Rome, Peter never was the rock, as we established already. The Pope is just falsely 
explaining Matthew 16. Yeah? And that's what Martin Luther deals here in this book, where we are busy with. It says that this is why St. Peter cannot be understood to have the common keys and the common office of the keys, which is forgiveness and retention of sin, for himself alone or peculiar to himself over the other apostles. And there is no exclusiveness here, as the Roman asses patch and invent. It does not say, to you alone, Peter. And even if it were so, the excluded would still not be the apostles, but perhaps Caiaphas and the Mosaic priesthood. In any case, Peter stands for all the apostles, as these two passages, Matthew 18 and John 20, prove forcefully and mightily. That is certain. But the Pope interprets Scripture his way. Well, that's the problem. Scripture always explains itself. But when a man, like the Pope, takes to him the authority, whether it is rightful authority or it is unrighteous authority, but he just usurps the authority to claim that he is the one who can explain Scripture, then everybody has to believe what he explains of Scripture. And the Pope says that he is the successor of Peter, which is a joke, which is not true. And this is where we are right now. Martin Luther defies the claims of the Pope, and we continue where we left off last time, in the middle of page 321. Uh, 320, sorry, uh, with the very first paragraph that I just read a few sentences to you, and we're going to continue here. Finally, Martin Luther says, there are deeds and events. St. Matthias, oh, Matthias was made an apostle not by St. Peter, but by Lot, confirmed by Christ in heaven and ordained to join the other eleven apostles, as we can read in Acts 1, verse 26. But if it is an article of faith, which is the lie of the Roman asses like to threaten to, uh, us with, that St. Peter alone has the keys as a privilege, that is, what the fools in Rome call it, then St. Peter and all the apostles with Matthias and sheer heretics, herefore acting contrary to this article, and for not allowing St. Matthias to be ordained and confirmed solely by St. Peter, who alone should have the keys over the whole world, and Christ himself will have to be under the Pope's ban. Christ himself will have to be under the Pope's ban, because he confirmed the heresy committed with St. Matthias. Oh, that poor sinner Christ! How can he ever attain forgiveness for his heresy and sin from the Roman Sea? I almost said, from those mules. And even though his papal holiness... <coughs> I liked that much more in the beginning of this book when <laughs> Martin Luther addressed the Pope as most hellish father. <laughs> and even though his papal holiness conceded to Christ as to a prince who is subject to no law the power to call after his ascension more apostles than he had on earth, none of these apostles can preach on earth or ordain bishops, but rather must go from the world into never-never land to preach, build churches and ordain bishops. Now the reason for this is, the Most Holy Father with his Saint Peter is, as his decrees declare, the bishop of the whole world, and no one may preach or ordain bishops except the Pope. That is why St. Matthias and the, others, and the other ten apostles must not have either room or position in the whole world to preach, build churches or ordain bishops, but only his quote-unquote papal holiness. You understand well what I mean. Or, if it should be be that each apostle had equal power with St. Peter, and each one had preached, built churches, and ordained bishops in his own part of the world, without the knowledge or command of St. Peter, but on the command of Christ. As was heard above in John 20, then it would follow that the papal holiness would have to do three things. First, 
condemn his decretals as desperate, stinking lies, and hit himself on his own lying, blaspheming mouth, since he boasts of being the high priest and sovereign of all the churches in the whole world, and makes Christ in Matthew 18 and John 20 and Acts 1 a liar and a heretic. Second, he should first seek to ascertain in which churches of the world St. Peter had preached, and which bishops he had ordained, so that he would not interfere with the churches and bishops of the other apostles, who are altogether as good and holy as the Roman bishop. For all of them have been ordained by those apostles whom Christ made equal in all things with St. Peter. Oh, here the Most Holy Father would have such, so much to do that he would not even be finished after Judgment Day. And where would the Roman Sea and the mulish reign in Rome be in the meantime? Third, he should also make sure that St. Peter had founded no churches, that St. Peter had ordained no bishops and preached in no churches except in Rome. If this is not the case, the Pope should also lose the, the Pope should also lose St. Peter with keys and all, but if St. Peter should have preached in other parts of the world, founded other churches and ordained more bishops, then the one in Rome cannot claim that he alone is the heir to St. Peter's throne. Rather, all the others can claim just as much as the Roman. St. Peter is our apostle, he has ordained our churches, he has ordained our bishops, therefore his keys are ours and not those of the bishop of Rome alone. Now it is certain that St. Peter was an apostle in Jerusalem, in Antioch, and, as his epistle testifies, in Asia. Pontus, Cappadocia, Bithynia, and Galatia, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. All these could boast against the bishop of Rome, and much more so against the Pope, who came after the bishops, being neither bishop nor Christian, quote, Dear Bishop, St. Peter is our apostle. We have the keys from him, and are superior to the Roman Church, for he has written his beautiful long letters to us. But he did not even write the shortest stem of the shortest letter to the Roman Church. How do you like that, snub ass pope? Yes, but St. Peter was martyred in Rome with St. Paul, as the decretals claim. Now that is beside the point. Thousands of martyrs lie in Rome who were martyred there, and yet none of them was Bishop of Rome. St. Stephen was martyred in Jerusalem, as we can read in Acts chapter 7, and of course to the latter parts, verses 59 through 60. But that did not make him Bishop of Jerusalem, did it? When one asks about St. Peter's office, his preaching, and how he ordained bishops in Rome, they quote Matthew 16 in justification of their actions. There are, however, several scholars who maintain that St. Peter never came to Rome. And may the Pope get indigestion defending himself against such evidence. I do not want to be the judge as, whether, as to whether or not St. Peter was in Rome, for probably only St. Paul, who certainly was there, as Luke writes in Acts 28.14, and he himself writes in his epistles, can have ordained the church and the bishop in Rome. But I can cheerfully say, as I have seen and heard in Rome, that in Rome one doesn't know where the bodies of St. Peter and St. Paul lie, for if they lie there at all, Pope and Cardinals know very well that they do not know that. Now we are going here into a little 
uh, footnote where it says that while in Rome Luther was told that parts of Peter's and Paul's bodies were buried in San Paolo. Okay? Now, <laughs> wherever parts are buried, uh, when you go into a Roman Catholic cathedral, uh, a cathedral is a cathedral because it always has relics dead bones of dead saints. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church always venerates dead saints, never the living, only the dead, because it's the church of the dead. They have so many parts of Peter all over the world, and of the other apostles and other things, for example the cross, <laughs> so many pieces of the true cross that Jesus Christ allegedly was nailed to, not that he was allegedly nailed to the cross, but that he was allegedly nailed to a cross where those pieces come from. Understand me correctly, please. You could hold a whole, you could build a whole ark, from a whole ark, yeah, like Noah's ark, from all the pieces of wood that are supposedly to be from the cross that Jesus was nailed to. Okay. So Rome is really, really into their relics. And if you want to understand more of that, then you have to read other books than this one from Martin Luther. And, uh, for example, uh, A Woman Rides a Beast from Dave Hunt and Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow, which I read on my channel, the latter one. Uh, you can get your information from there. Uh, there is no proof that St. Peter or St. Paul, the Apostles of Jesus Christ, ever were in Rome. St. Paul, yes, but St. Peter, no. There is no proof of that. That's why it is everywhere, and even generally acknowledged, that St. Paul was the Apostle to the Gentiles, not St. Peter. And when St. Paul was in Rome, he never mentioned St. Peter. The only Peter that was in Rome, that was Simon Peter, Simon Magus, yeah, that one that we know from Acts chapter 8. And in the future I will do the reading of the booklet of Ernest L. Martin about Simon Magus versus Simon the Sorcerer. Uh, so <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Simon Magus versus Simon Peter. Yeah? So, Peter the Apostle. That St. Peter was never in Rome. And then you say, yeah, but when you go to the Vatican today and you go to St. Peter's Cathedral, you see a statue of St. Peter in the Vatican. That's right. That statue of St. Peter, first of all, is an image. And uh, we all know what God says about images. Second of all, this one is Jupiter and it comes from the Pantheon. The old pagan Roman god Jupiter had a statue in the Pantheon, and that was taken to St. Peter's Cathedral, and then baptized St. Peter. That's how the pagans baptized themselves with Christianity. That's only one example of it. Okay, But I don't want to go too deep into that, but we can rest assured that Pope and Cardinals know very well that they do not know that St. Peter ever was in Rome. They don't know. There is no biblical and no historical record of it whatsoever. And yet, Martin Luther continues, on St. Peter and Paul's day, they display two heads, pretend and let the common man believe that these are the natural heads of the apostles. So to reverend mob comes running along with John Doe of Gina. Huh? Um, here we go into a reference to the symbol of the city of Gina, a head of the face of the big clock at the town hall trying to reach an apple which is offered by a bearded man whenever the bell hammer strikes. But the Pope, Cardinals and their riffraff know quite well that they are two wooden, carved and painted heads. It is just the same as they do with the cloth of St. Veronica. They pretend it is our Lord's face imprinted on a handkerchief. All it is, is a small black square board with a shred of cloth hanging on it, and over that hangs another shred of cloth, which they pull up 
when they show St. Veronica's. But poor John Doe can see nothing any more but a shred of cloth in front of a black board. That is called showing and seeing the cloth of Veronica, and there is much pious reverence and many indulgences for such crude lies. This damned ass pope and his accursed school of scoundrels in Rome take such great immeasurable pleasure in making a monkey fool and laughing stock of the poor Christian man, indeed in blaspheming against God in heaven and causing such idolatry in his holy church. He laughs up his sleeve. <laughs> to see such blasphemous, idolatrous lies worshipped, and robs and steals the goods and obedience of the whole world for it, that one is forced to understand that the papacy is, as was said above, the very image of the devil, set in the church by the devil, to do nothing but instigate lies, blasphemy, and idolatry, in order to destroy faith, and God's word, and thus rub the world under him of all it has and owns, and lead all the souls to the devil. This is a whole paragraph, one sentence, so important that I want to repeat it, that you follow me well and quite understand it correctly, I hope. Martin Luther says, this damned ass Pope and his accursed school of scoundrels in Rome take such great and measurable pleasure in making a monkey, fool and laughingstock of the poor Christian man, indeed, in blaspheming against God and heaven and causing such idolatry in his holy church, he laughs up his sleeves to see such blasphemous idolatrous lies worshipped and robs and steals the goods and obedience of the whole world for it, that one is forced to understand that the papacy is, as said above, the very image of the devil set in the church by the devil to do nothing but instigate lies, instigate blasphemy and idolatry in order to destroy faith and God's word, and thus rob the world under him of all it has and owns and lead all souls to the devil. Well, as was said, the apostles St. Peter and St. Paul may or may not lie in Rome. Not this, but who founded the church and bishopric there is relevant. So, not this, if St. Peter or St. Paul actually lie in Rome or not, is important, but who founded the church and bishopric there in Rome is relevant. So Martin Luther says, says, let's focus on the real issue here. And the point is, as I said already before, we are not going into this here by Martin Luther, but we are going into that when we read the book from Ernest L. Martin, Simon Magus versus Simon Peter. But Martin Luther continues, For St. Paul does not lie in Corinth, does not lie in Philippi, Thessalonica, Colossae, or other churches, where he nevertheless established and ordained churches, so that, as far as St. Peter is concerned, there is almost no other church that has an uncertain beginning, except the Roman. Martin Luther points to the point <laughs> to the fact that only the Roman church has an uncertain beginning. They do write that St. Peter sat in Rome for 25 years, but a lie like this devours itself. For he was still in Jerusalem when St. Paul came to him more than 18 years after our Lord's ascension, as we can read in Galatians 1 verse 18 and 2 verse 11, and is said to have set in Antioch for seven years, from which the festival of St. Peter's throne is known. Now, this Festum Cathedre Petri Antiochanae is celebrated on February 22nd. 
It is a traditional holy day that dates back to the 4th century when the Church of Rome introduced it to counteract the pagan ancestry, ancestry cult. So, this is another baptization of a Christian feast by, by way of speaking because it's the festival of St. Peter's throne so the misuse of St. Peter for pagan purposes this is again the same abuse here on the 22nd of February as it says here in the footnote and this goes back to the 4th century so when is the 4th century becoming very interesting for the church that we are speaking about here right 321, when Constantine baptized the pagan Roman Empire with the garments of the Catholic, uh, of, of the Christian Church, of the real Christian Church, when he made, quote unquote, Christianity the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire, okay, in the 4th century. So this Festum Cathedrae Petri Antinochiae celebrated on February 22nd, was instituted in the 4th century. One of the very first baptizing, let me, let me call it this way, of a Christian feast or whatever into the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? Now, altogether, Martin Luther continues here, that makes 45 years. Huh? So we have had um, the years that he counts here, 25 years. They do write that St. Peter sat in Rome for 25 years, but a lie like this devours itself. For he was still in Jerusalem when St. Paul came to him more than 18 years after our Lord's ascension in Galatians 1 and 2, and is said to have sat in Antioch for seven years, from which the festival of St. Peter's throne that I just explained to you is known. So altogether that makes 45 years in the count of uh, Martin Luther here. Thus Peter seems to have lived eight years after Nero, who is supposed to have martyred him, for Nero stepped himself 37 years after Christ's ascension. They lie and invent such confusions about St. Peter from the hundreds to the thousands that I have not the delusion that neither Peter nor Paul laid the first stone of the church in Rome. And I agree with Martin Luther here. Neither Peter nor Paul laid the first stone of the church in Rome. The first stone of the church in Rome was laid by Simon Magus, Simon the sorcerer, the Sadducee, who wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit from the Apostles in Acts 8. He is the one who founded the Roman Church. That's why they call their hierarchy, by the way, the Magisterium. Magisterium comes from Magi, Simon Magus. He was a magician. He was a sorcerer. And that is not me saying this. This is not Ernest L. Martin saying this. This is the Bible speaking. Because the Bible says so in Acts chapter 8. We read in Acts chapter 8, in verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So the Bible says it, that he used sorcery. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. It continues in verse 11. So, it's not me saying that, it's not Ernest L. Martin, Martin saying it, it's the Bible who explains this to you, right? And Martin Luther continues here and says, They lie and invent such confusions about St. Peter from the hundreds to the thousands that I have got the delusion uh, that I have got the delusion that neither Peter nor Paul laid the first stone of the church in Rome. And I, Jörg, assure you that first stone of the church in Rome, that cornerstone where the Pope is building his whole authority today on and throughout history, is laid by Simon Magus. 
the sorcerer we just read about in Acts chapter 8. Now, Martin Luther continues, Instead, possibly, a disciple of the apostles of Jerusalem or Antioch came to Rome and preached the faith in Christ with a, in a few houses. Or, as was usual at that time, some Jews living in Rome, like Achaia and Priscilla, etc., went to Jerusalem for Easter and Pentecost, learned the faith there, and brought it home to their relations, both Jews and Gentiles, in Rome. Well, I absolutely do not disagree with Martin Luther here that Achaia and Priscilla, who were also mentioned in the book of Acts, brought this to Rome because we learn in the complete book of Acts that a lot of Jews who are living in foreign countries like Italy, like Rome, like Greece, like Asia, like Egypt, like Syria all of these countries, they come to the feast days in Jerusalem and they are made known with Jesus Christ through the apostles who taught Jesus Christ crucified in their own language. You know, you remember the gift of tongues given to the apostles so that they could speak to Jewish brethren who come out of the realm of Judea, who did not live in Israel at that time or in Jerusalem at that time, but came there for the feasts. And Achaia and Priscilla were those people, and they came apparently from Rome. And of course it is possible that they came to Rome and preached that there. But the point is that we are speaking about a corrupt Roman Catholic Church. And Achaia and Priscilla maybe went to Rome and preached the gospel, as they have learned by the apostles in Jerusalem, and even founded a righteous biblical apostolic church in Rome, but whether that church became apostate or was taken over by Simon Magus at some point. That's my point that I'm making here. And this is not mere speculation. We know of people who lived in north, northern Italy, the Albigenses and the Waldenses, years, years later. They must have come from somewhere. And of course we know of the persecution of the Christians, among others, by Emperor Nero. So, to me, it is very clear that people like Achaia and Priscilla, who first came to Rome and preached Jesus crucified were persecuted and had to flee. And by that they flew into the northern Italy, maybe into Piedmont or some other region over there, and kept living there and founded churches over there. But the church that they left in Rome, in the meantime, became corrupt. Because when the good leader of a church is gone, the church always gets corrupt, right? Look at all the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament to the Church of Rome, Corinth, Thessalonica, Galatia, Ephesia, and all the others. All these churches, and Jesus Christ says the same in Revelation 1 and 2, that all these churches have become apostate. At the moment when the leader is gone, the church became apostate. It always was that way and will always be that way. Look at the Lutheran church. Huh? When Luther founded his church on the Bible, on Sola Scriptura, it was fine. But when he was gone, what happened with that? Hmm? In 1999, the World Lutheran Foundation, or Federation, the World Lutheran Federation, signed a joint declaration of justification with the Roman Catholic Church. Need I say more? No, eh? So, don't get me wrong, I don't disagree with Martin Luther here. I'm just adding to what he says from a more historical background that maybe he did not have at that time. He says, and I'm going to continue this sentence so that... Um, that other Jews living in Rome, like Achaia and Priscilla, etc., went to Jerusalem for Easter and Pentecost, that's absolutely biblical, that's in the Bible, learned the faith there and brought it home to their relations, both Jews and Gentiles in Rome. 
I am led to this by Romans 16, wherein St. Paul greets many saints in Rome by name, although neither he nor St. Peter had come there yet for Aquila, and all the Jews were driven from Rome by Claudius, as we can read in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. This is Emperor Claudius, who reigned between 41 and 54 AD. And yet were greeted first. Huh? Now this is nothing for the Roman church to be ashamed of. For when Paul came there later, to, uh, he undoubtedly organized and improved everything as he promised in Romans 1, 8, verses 8 through 15, wherein he praised their faith highly, which neither he nor St. Peter had planted. St. Peter did the same thing, though he came to Rome at another time. In Crete too, St. Paul's disciples Titus ordained bishops and founded churches, as St. Paul commands him to do in Titus 1, verse 5. Well, what happens to St. Paul, the great apostle, in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6? When heaven had struck St. Paul down near Damascus, the Lord told him to go into the city where he would be told what to do. Isn't this a miracle? Such an apostle is not first referred to Jerusalem, to St. Peter and other apostles, but to an ordinary disciple, Ananias who lays his hands on him, that he might receive the Holy Spirit. What does that lying ass in Rome have to say to this? He who, with his Peter, claims to be Lord and Master of all the world's churches. This Apostle Paul gives him a greater push than St. Matthias and the other ten Apostles, whom the Pope drives into Never Never Land together with their apostolic office, because he wishes to be the teacher of the whole world. He wishes to be the teacher of the whole world, therefore he is not. Paul uncovers the rogue completely, front and back, so one sees beneath his lies as into the realm of hellish Satan. For there are his epistles, about fourteen, which clearly show how many churches and bishops in the world he ordained without St. Peter, and certainly without the Pope all of whom can say that St. Paul, and not St. Peter, is their apostle. Therefore the Pope, with his Peter, yes, with his devil, and with his Peter, I'd say, with his Simon Magus, has no authority or power over them, and his lying mouth should be cursed, since he claims to be the head of all the churches and master of the Christian faith, or, to speak Roman, master of all lies, blasphemy and idolatry. Oh, what more can one say? It is said that St. Paul says, quote, God shows no partiality, unquote. Yeah? We read this in Acts 10, verse 34. Non est apud deum personarum respectus. Yeah? Means God is no respecter of persons, in other words. The church in Antioch was founded by none of the apostles, but by Barnabas, or as is written in Acts 13, verse 1, by the prophets and teachers Barnabas, Lucius, Simeon, Manaean, and Saul. So it is certain that at this time Saul was not yet ordained an apostle among the Gentiles, which occurs soon afterwards in the same chapter, verses 2 through 3, Acts 13, that is. Now the church in Antioch was exemplary, Oh, sorry, now the church in Antioch was an exemplary church, far superior to the Roman one, and also had, as it is written, as many martyrs as stones in the city wall, although Rome, too, had more than the usual number of martyrs, but it never had schools and learned scholars like this. That is true, and never will get them. Therefore, it is pointless to say, quote, this church was founded by an apostle, unquote. 
Those are thoughts of the flesh, which God does not respect. Moreover, they are lies. To contradict this, there is Antioch, which was founded by no apostle, and surpasses many others, even those founded by apostles. The church in Alexandria was not founded by an apostle either, but by St. Mark, whom, come, uh, whom some call the evangelist, and others call something else. But it is certain that no apostle went there, and yet this church is far superior to the Roman church. There was an excellent school there, which helped many countries. Athanasius and many other great teachers come from it. There never was a school in Rome, nor did any particularly learned people come from there. These two churches, Antioch and Alexandria, were the best and most useful, as one knows from all the histories, yet, and we, we, we uh, turn for that for all the histories uh, to page 7 in this book, I'm not going to do that right now, do it in, when you have your own copy, yeah? But it says, yet they were never subject to the Roman church, much less to the master. I wanted to say, liar of the world, the Pope. Hippo, and we are speaking about Hippo Regis in North Africa, was a town perhaps as big as Wittenberg. It had a bishop, namely St. Augustine, who did more for the churches than all the popes and bishops of Rome melted into one pile from his school, many fine bishops here and there in many lands have been ordained, and St. Gregory admits that his writing compared with St. Augustine's writing are as chaff compared with wheat. And that is true. Furthermore, this bishop St. Augustine was never subject to the bishop of Rome, much less to the murderer of souls and devourer of the world, the Pope. That is why it means nothing to judge these things according to persons or externals, and allege, quote, This church is greater, this one has an apostle, this one is richer, this one is nobler, this is the church of an imperial city. Unquote. Worldly and finite matters may and must be determined by these things. God sets no store by them. He wants to be independent with his spirit and gifts and have freedom as is right to give to a small church such people as he does not give to all the great churches such as our example of Hippo and our Wittenberg too. The Holy Spirit and his gifts are not inheritable goods subject to worldly law or tied to a place. His motto is, quote, it blows where it wills. Unquote. Not, quote, it blows where we want it. Unquote. Now, this letter, of course, was a quote from John chapter 3, verse 8. Quote, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Martin Luther was referring to this quote, Spirat ubi vult, Spirat ubi nos columnus, if you read it in Latin, when he said, his motto is, it blows where it wills, not it blows where we want it. Now that's exactly the point. Uh, the Holy Spirit is actually the Spirit of our Creator God. And that Spirit does what God wants, <laughs> not what we want. So, it blows where it wills, and it doesn't blow where we want it. So Martin Luther continues, the Pope probably thinks the Holy Spirit is tied to Rome. Yeah, that's what he thinks. The Holy Spirit is tied to Rome. Well, that's what he's going to make you believe, because why? Well, if you have trouble understanding that, you don't un then you don't even understand the title of the Pope, which is Vicarius Filii Dei. Who is the real representative of Jesus, Jesus Christ in this world? Well, the one that Jesus Christ said that he would send when he has to leave this world. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. The Pope 
is blaspheming the Holy Ghost, a sin that is not forgiven in this life, not in the next life either, by presenting to him that he is the Holy Spirit. So, it blows where we want it, it, blow, it uh, that's what the Pope says, because he is the one embodying the Holy Spirit in this world. And he blows the Holy Spirit where he, the Popes, want him to be. That's what he teaches in his satanic, diabolical synagogue of Satan. But that, of course, is not the teaching of the Bible. And we have to understand that and to fully grasp it. You know, the Holy Spirit blows where it wills, not it blows where we want it. But the Pope probably thinks the Holy Spirit is tied to Rome. There is no Holy Spirit outside of Rome, as the Holy, uh, as the Holy, <laughs> as the hellish Father says. There is no salvation outside of Rome either. Now Martin Luther continues: If he could produce reliable seals and letters to prove it, he would have won. If he wants to be head of all the churches, which is impossible, then he must first prove to us that he and his descendants must, beyond any doubt, be the possessors by inheritance of the Holy Spirit, and cannot err. Yes, I would like to see those seals and briefs. For his allegation, based on Matthew 16, that the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church, is built on the rock, so that the gates of hell shall not overcome it, has been clearly enough proven above to have been said of the whole of Christendom and not of the Roman Papal See alone. And the summation is, as was said, that God sets to store in his realm by the great, high, powerful, many, many wise, noble, etc., but, as Mary sings, he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, as we can read in Luke 1.48. And as he says to his apostles in Matthew 18, verses 20 and 26 through 28, and on many other occasions, quote, Whoever would be great among you must be the least, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as I did not come to be served, but to serve among you. Unquote. But in the papacy and all the decretals, the main point is that he, the Pope alone, is the greatest, the highest, and mightiest, to whom no one is equal, whom no one should condemn or judge, but to whom everyone should be subject, and by whom everyone should let himself be judged. And yet, at the same time, he claims to be a servant of all the servants of God, that is, in a Roman and in a popish way, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and set above all Christians, that is, set above God, set above Jesus Christ, and above the Holy Spirit, who lives and dwells in all Christians, according to John chapter 15, verses 14, 17, and 23. It is he whom St. Paul calls in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, quote, the man of sin and the son of perdition, unquote, the Antichrist who has rebelled against God and set himself up above him. Christendom has no head and can have none except the only Son of God, Jesus Christ, who has seals and briefs so that he cannot err and who is tied neither to Rome nor any other place, because the world is his footstool. The world is his and everything in it. He is not tied to Rome or any other place, because all places are his. Now Martin Luther continues to turn to the passage in Matthew 16. Tell me, how could the Pope show and deliver into our hands a finer, more powerful passage in all of Scripture against himself, so that we can damn his blasphemous papacy into the ground and destroy it. In his decretals he interprets the rock on which Christ wants to build his church thusly, 
quote, Rock does not mean Christ, but the power and lordship of St. Peter, that is, his own invented untrue sovereignty over the whole world, which Christ is said to have given to St. Peter and the Pope with the word rock that all the churches are built on such a rock means that they must all obey the Pope or be eternally damned so that not even the blood of Christ could help prevent it. Isn't this beautiful exegesis? The Lord says, quote, I am the rock. The building on it is faith in me. Unquote. <laughs> that is how this is to be understood. The building on Jesus Christ is the faith in Jesus Christ. By faith you are saved through grace and that not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. The Lord says, I am the rock. The building on it is faith in me. Against this, hear the Pope. The rock is my power and authority. The building on it is the obedience of all Christians to me. The Pope, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of sin. Thus he leads Christians from faith in Christ to himself and teaches them instead of faith and obedience to him, which is a work instituted by man, indeed by the devil, upon which Christians should depend. That is, have the devil as an idol and worship him. We Christians know that even the works of God's commandments, to which the holy devout are obedient, are not enough if the building on this rock, that is, faith in Jesus Christ, does not sustain us. How then can obedience to the Pope, which is something invented by man, and, what is more, is devil's work and idolatry, help us? How then can obedience to the Pope help us? Is the main sentence here. It cannot, because when you choose rather to obey men instead of God, you turn against God. It is even said in the Bible, you cannot serve two masters. You will either love the one and despise the other. You cannot serve two masters. How then can obedience to the Pope help us? It can't, because it's idolatry. Now for the Pope, or rather the evil spirit in him, knows quite well that if the rock, Jesus Christ, and the building on it, the faith in Jesus Christ, were to remain, and if the words, on this rock I will build my church, should be understood as, my Christians should and shall believe in me, then he could have done nothing, nor could he have made a pope. What can you do with these words? My church will be built on me, the rock, it will believe in me, trust in me and depend on me. What can you make of these words? I say, except that all Christians, or the whole of Christendom even, and anyone claiming to be a Christian, will believe in Jesus Christ and put their trust in Him as on a rock, so that even the gates of hell, that is, all the devils, may not harm them. No Pope can admit or tolerate this meaning, since it does not refer us either to Popes, Bishops, or to any human being, be he King or Emperor, but assembles us all under the only Son of God, the true rock of our salvation. Assembles us so completely upon Christ alone, that we have to forsake even ourselves, and our good works, and be made just and holy solely through faith in him. You know, there's a quote of Martin Luther, I think that is even as a picture in this video, but I'm not sure right now. But I'm going to read to you that quote in a second. The quote says, Our works do not generate righteousness, rather our righteousness in Christ generates works. 
That is what Martin Luther said. That is what Martin Luther thinks about saving works. Right? Why am I saying this? Because in this last sentence we read, no Pope can admit or tolerate this meaning, since it does not refer us either to Pope, bishops, or to any human being, be he king, emperor, but assembles us all under the Son of God, the true rock of our salvation, assembles us to so completely upon Christ alone, that we have to forsake even ourselves and our good works, and be made just and holy solely through faith in Him. Sola fide. By faith alone that we can even forsake our good works. And therefore it is important to understand that in the Protestant, in the Biblical, in the true understanding of works, Martin Luther speaks the truth when he says, our works do not generate righteousness, rather our righteousness in Christ generates works. Unquote. This is so a 180 degree opposite of what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Because the Roman Catholic Church says, through the works in the Roman Catholic Church you are saved. Grace is infused to you through the sacraments. That is what the Roman Catholic Church says. Outside of the Roman Catholic Church there is no salvation, she states. And why is that? Because you have to work through all her seven sacraments to achieve righteousness. And Luther says, as it is biblical, biblically sustained, our works do not generate righteousness, rather our righteousness in Christ generates works. You know, it is so easy to understand that. I am sitting here on my computer reading to you this book against the Roman papacy, an institution by the devil written by Martin Luther in 1545. And I do that not because I want to generate righteousness in myself, but because I am saved through Jesus Christ and his righteousness in me generates these works, generates this reading, generates this commenting. And that's the same with me as it is with Tom Fress, as it is with Brad Norman. I cannot speak for many others because I don't know any others who have the same righteousness in Jesus Christ and the same works that generates the same righteousness. There are not so many people that I am even aware of that have that. But the point being is that our works do not generate any righteousness. But our righteousness in Christ, when we are born again and we have accepted Jesus Christ, being born of a virgin, died on the cross, shed his blood for our sins, died and risen three days later and ascended up to heaven. And when we profess that all over the world, then Jesus Christ imputes righteousness into us, us and this righteousness creates or generates the works. That is why the Bible says, by their fruits you will know them. What are the fruits of my work? Well, all the work that I'm doing, the same with Tom Fress, the same with Brett Norman. And by the fruits you will know whether we speak the truth or not. And that's with every priest and with every pastor, exactly the same thing. And with every bishop and cardinal and pope. So, measure them by their fruits. Their fruits are the works that are generated through righteousness in Jesus Christ, or in another spirit. And that's the problem with the Roman Catholic Church. It is led by another spirit. The Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, the whole hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the cardinals, the bishop, the archbishops, the deacons, the pastors, the, the priests, and all that stuff, they all don't have the righteousness in Jesus Christ. They have another spirit. And their fruits are the lies that they put out into the world. The lie of a futurist antichrist, the lie of a rapture, secret or openly. The only rapture the Bible speaks about is the, what happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's no rapture. That's why even the word is not in the Bible. But when he comes, we will all be caught up. And we change in a second, in the wink of an eye. 
and will be with our Lord forever. That's no rapture. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. There is no secret rapture of the church. There is no future antichrist. Forget about all these lies. Lean on the good works that you can do because, as Martin Luther says, your righteousness through Jesus, your righteousness in Jesus Christ. You have righteousness through Jesus Christ. Those works, what you generate and what the fruits of those works are, are the fruits by which you should measure every person, everyone in this world. By their fruits you will know them. Not on what they say, but on what they do. That's why they have that saying, don't do as I do, but do as I say. Because when you do as they do, you will very, very fast learn that there is nothing righteous in them. And the Bible says it, there is nobody, uh, no one righteous, no, not one. So, but we are imputed righteousness through Jesus Christ. And that righteousness generates works. And those works are spreading the gospel, spreading the truth, and shouting from the rooftops that the papacy, the Roman papacy, is an institution of the devil and is the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. That's it. And when you come to that view, all of a sudden you will see the world in a different light. But therefore we have to humble ourselves, as it was said here a little bit earlier. So, I have come to page 328 and I'm going to end the reading here today. Thank you very much for watching, listening and studying with me. And please, as I always say, do your own research. Your own research. Don't parrot what others say. Not me, not anybody else, but do your own research based on the true books, truth books that you can find. Start with the Bible, the King James of 1611 and come to the same conclusion that the Bible comes, that the Waldenses, the Albigenses and all the Protestants, Wycliffe, Huss, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Mortimer, Latimer, Henry Gretton Guinness, James Edgar Wiley, all these persons came to. The papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. Until next time, Jörg from Joggler66 says God bless you, signing off and bye bye. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape